happy Monday and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. Of course, Monday, it is Will and Charlie podcast. Uh, Will Salatan, my colleague from the Bulwark, uh, joins me. So do you have a good weekend? Do you have a good, ha- happy Mother's Day? I did. I had a great time. I was with family. Uh, I got together and had, saw people I hadn't seen in quite a while. It's like the post-COVID, last COVID wave celebration of getting back together. That is great. Okay, so there's a lot of things to talk about today. I mean, today is has been on everybody's calendar. Uh, Victory Day in Russia, uh, May 9th. And of course, there was a lot of speculation that that Vladimir Putin might declare victory or something like that, or a formal announcement of mobilization, uh, actually declaring war. None of this actually happened. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the tweets from uh, General Mark Hurtling uh, this morning. And he said, you know, what was not said, but observed, uh, the troop and equipment parade seems smaller than usual. Sad. Very low energy. <laughs> there was no aircraft Z pattern overflight. Okay, so they were talking about having these planes fly over. Okay, so their excuse was bad weather, but the skies were completely clear. So General Garamasov, is that how you pronounce his name? Was not there. There were rumors that he was wounded in Ukraine. And for some reason, there was a hammer and sickle flag behind a Russian tricolor. So they're sort of bringing back a lot of all this. So General Hurtling, and he admits he's speculating here. He says, you know, maybe, you know, Putin knows he's losing militarily, diplomatically, economically, informationally, and that it's going to get worse. So even though the temptation must have been great, he didn't spike the football. Maybe he's looking for a way out. We, we just don't know. But anyway, none of the horrific things that people thought would, would uh, might happen on May 9th have happened. So that's that's a positive. Happy Monday, Will. At least we have that. Right? <laughs> no, no nuclear war. We're here. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And we're all still here. So before we get into everything, and of course, you know, the Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, fallout just becomes more intense, which, by the way, is welcome to your life over the next uh, decade. Before we get into that, I, I just wanted to, I, like, with my newsletter, I, I wanted to start uh, with a bit of, like, a little tidbit of political decency. And for people who, who, who might have missed this. Uh, There's a South Carolina Republican congressman named Tom Rice. He's not the most famous. He doesn't get as much attention as, you know, folks like uh, Liz Cheney. He is running for reelection. He faces a primary challenge because he's one of the tiny, tiny number of Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump after the attack on the Capitol. And what's interesting about Rice, and, and I remember when his vote was cast, it was it was a surprise. People didn't see him you know, as an anti-Trump or never Trump. Well, he's not backing down. And he had a debate in his primary uh, last week. And uh, our friends at the Republican Accountability Project uh, tweeted it out. But I just want to play this and just talk about it. It runs almost three minutes, but it's so rare that you hear this kind of clarity, particularly from a Republican elected official who is still running for re-election. So let's play this. This is Congressman Tom Rice just last week during a primary debate. Democracy is a fragile thing. (laughs) And the one thing that we have to protect us from tyranny is our Constitution. And our Constitution has to be protected at all costs. Our framers, to protect us against tyranny, set up a separation of powers where the legislature makes laws but can't enforce them. The executive enforces laws but can't make them. And the judiciary decides disputes. And they wanted us, they charged us in the federal papers, each branch with jealously protecting their powers because they knew that men were corrupt. And if they had too much power concentrated in one place, that corruption would overwhelm them. My friends, I was there on January 6th. I wasn't absent. Mm -hmm. I was there. I I saw the bomb squads diffusing bombs. I smelled the tear gas. I was on the House floor when the glass was breaking when they were trying to break down the doors. When we evacuated, I passed Capitol Police officers who were beaten and broken and being pulled from the lines. When we got to the spot where we were evacuated, Fox News was on TV. I was getting calls from back here from friends and the news. And as I was talking to the news media back here, I kept saying, where's the president? Where's the president? Where's the president? But he never came on. 
I knew he was going to come on and say, Let's, the violence has got to stop. But he didn't for four hours. Later, I asked my staff to pull the records on what he was doing at that time. And he was sitting in his dining room next to the Oval Office, proud that these people would be in, in, in sacking the U.S. Capitol, beating up the Capitol Police officers, and he did nothing to stop it. In fact, 20 minutes after they were in the Capitol, he tweeted out, Mike Pence doesn't have courage. My friends, you can argue about whether his speech that morning was incitement or not, but to me, that one tweet was incitement. If they'd have gotten hold of Mike Pence, we could have lost our democracy that day. So it, if, if, in my opinion, my opinion is that, is that our Constitution is too precious to risk. And the one difference between me and all those leaders back in Washington who said, oh, Donald Trump went too far, he should be impeached, he should be removed, and then voted the other way, <clears throat> I took the principal stand and I defended our Constitution. Wow, that is interesting. The one difference between me and all those leaders back in Washington, <laughs> I took the principal stand and I defended our Constitution. So, you know, Will, I, I'm listening to that, and I don't know much about Tom Rice. I don't know what his background is, but I, I'm, I'm looking at him and saying, you know, this is just character. You know, we talk about, you know, where are principal leaders and, you know, we need to reform the system, you know, money in politics. And, and, and none of that actually goes to the question of how do you get decent people and then back them? How, how do you get representatives who exercise this kind of courage, knowing full well that he could lose his position? And I, and I guess I'm, I'm highlighting it because that kind of political decency and courage is so vanishingly rare these days. Your thoughts? Well, what I heard was Tom Rice telling the truth. Um, it, it was almost unremarkable what he said. He described what happened on January 6th. He described the president's failure to intervene for quite some time. Um, all of that is true. And the remarkable thing to me isn't that Tom Rice said this. It's that nobody else does say it. Nobody else in the Republican Party other than Liz Cheney, who gets kicked out of, uh, and, and Adam Kinzinger, who, who are, you know, voted out by the Republican National Committee, sanctioned for telling the truth. So it, it's, it's not to me surprising that he said this, although I commend him for it. It's that all he did, all he did was tell the truth about what the president did and didn't do that day. And yeah. so it remains shocking to me that for that, you know, 200 other people in the in the House <laughs> Republican caucus don't do that. I think that's right. OK, so let's talk about the fallout from Roe v. Wade and again. We continue to have the back and forth. Let's play a couple of sound bites. The uh, completely deplorable Ted Cruz was on one of the was he on one of the Sunday shows? I, I, I sort of lose track of all of this talking about the issue as he sees it behind the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So here is Ted Cruz yesterday. There are very, very different views on what the appropriate rules should be. And for the first 185 years of our nation's history, we resolved those in the elected legislatures. Then in 1973, seven unelected lawyers wearing black robes said, you, you silly voters, you don't get to decide. We know better than you, and we're going to decree the answer for the entire country. And I think that decision in Roe really caused an enormous amount of anger and frustration for the tens of millions of people who, who passionately care about this issue, who've been engaged in this issue. You had these unelected judges saying, your views don't matter and there's no outlet for you to fight for them. All right, that actually, you know, I mean, leaving aside who Ted Cruz is, that pretty much encapsulates... I would say, the conservative position on the political fallout from the original Roe versus Wade. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, in effect, responds to him. Let's play that. And I think the question that voters are going to be asking when 75 percent of people are with us on this is who should make this decision? Should it be a woman and her doctor or a politician? Should it be Ted Cruz making this decision or a woman and her family? OK, so Will Salatin, let's step back from all of this. This is the heart of the debate, who decides, isn't it? Yeah. So that is the pro-choice message. And I want to explain why it is powerful right. and why it is likely to prevail. So Ted Cruz's message um, is the message we've heard from a lot of Republicans since the Supreme Court ruling was leaked. 
it is, uh, look, these justices, a bunch of guys in robes, a bunch of justices in robes making this decision for you. They shouldn't be able to take this decision away from you. You, the voters, you, the states, should have the power to make your own laws. It's an, it's an empowerment of the listener, right? You should have the power, not these people. The pro-choice message takes that argument one step further, and it says, why if we're taking this, you know, why should this be decision be taken out of the hands of the Supreme Court and given to governors and state legislatures? That too is political concentration of power. Again, the decision should be left not just to the states, but further should be left to the individual. You know, and it, this is, I have to point out, a conservative principle. Government is best when it governs closest to the people, right? State governments are closer to you than the Supreme Court is, but you are really close to it. If this happens in your family, you should be the one to make this decision. And you can be pro-life. You can believe that abortion is wrong. And that decision, according to this argument, is still best left to the individual. That message resonates deeply with every American tradition, the liberal tradition, the conservative tradition. And I, I still believe that that message, which prevailed the last time the Supreme Court came close to overturning Roe, will prevail again this time politically. Well, politically, I've gotten a lot of blowback about our discussions about late term abortions. Uh, you know, there are some interesting statistics out there about uh, the politics of abortion. Uh, you know, three quarters of abortions are, are done during the first trimester. Actually, 79 percent of abortions in this country take place during the first trimester, which is 12 weeks uh, or, or earlier. It's also interesting that when you look at abortions after 16 weeks, it makes up only four percent of the cases. And that's reflected in public opinion, too. Uh, you have the public, which very, seems to strongly support legalized abortion in the first trimester, but that drops off the table dramatically when you get to later. So there, there, there seems to be, you know, a a compromise position there, which is that you, you know, legalize abortion in at least the first trimester um, with more restrictions later. But I don't hear anyone taking that position. I mean, even though that seems to be the political consensus in this country, I don't see any possibility or any momentum for elected leaders or the activists to embrace that kind of a compromise. Yeah, well, this is going to take place in a couple of stages. Now, we're already at the first stage of having the conversation that you're talking about. And the first stage is around viability or the second versus third trimester, that line right there. And there's a dispute going on in Congress right now. There are a couple of bills. There's a Democratic bill and then there's sort of a pro-choice Republican bill. And they disagree a little bit about this. But the question is, I mean, under Roe, right, under Roe, states can ban in the third trimester. So it should be fairly easy to stipulate from the pro-choice point of view, look, we're not going to fight about the third trimester. There, it, should, it can be presumptively illegal. You can bring, if you have an exceptional case where something terrible has happened during the pregnancy and the woman needs an abortion, that can can be an exception, but the presumption is it's going to be illegal. And Charlie, your stats are, from my point of view, generous. I mean, in terms of the stats that I've seen from the Guttmacher Institute, which is a pro-choice organization, are that 93%, 93% of abortions are taking place in the first 13 weeks of, of pregnancy. Then it's 6% mm -hmm. up through from about 14 through 20. And beyond 20, it's 1%. It's 1% out there. So if you're pro-choice, why are you fighting and risking the whole thing over the 1%, particularly when you could get the same results, which is like in exceptional cases, a woman can get an abortion after viability, but it has to be an exceptional circumstance. Concede that concede that, that we're fighting about exceptions and not whether it will be presumptively legal at that point, because you got 99% of the other abortions to worry about, right? And politically, the Republicans know that if they can make the fight about that last 1%, they win. Well, exactly. Okay. So let me double back on the, the point you were making about sending this back to the states, that the states should decide all of this. Um, over the weekend, there was a lot of publicity about comments that Mitch McConnell made, where he seemed to be suggesting the possibility of a national ban, which is moving the goalpost. Your take on all that. And I, I think I mentioned this before the podcast that I, I thought that was very off brand for Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell generally, you know, doesn't 
want to nationalize these issues. He's been resisting having the Republicans take any sort of a stand. So what did Mitch McConnell say? What is he up to? Okay, so I don't think Mitch McConnell is up to anything here. Remember, let's back up about Mitch McConnell. What Mitch McConnell has said about the 2022 election is basically, we're going to win this. Republicans are going to win this if we don't screw it up. The last thing Mitch McConnell wants to do is introduce a new issue into this election, particularly one exactly. on which he is on the well, losing exactly. side. Right. So, so he has no reason to do that. So let's back up and look at what he said. Mitch McConnell was interviewed by USA Today. And Mitch McConnell, this is one of those things where the reporter brings up an idea. The politician responds to it. And then it's reported as though the politician brought it up. No, he did not bring it up. And what McConnell actually said basically was, yeah, it could happen. Like the, the Congress could re pass restrictions on abortion. But then he talks about how he's not, I mean, the one thing Mitch McConnell said is, I'm not going to have a carve out to the filibuster for this issue, right? Meaning you're going to have to get 60 votes to pass anything. And of course, they're not going to get 60 votes to pass any abortion restrictions in the, in the Senate uh, uh, un, under the current lineup. And, and there's no prospect of Republicans yeah. having 60 seats. So nothing is going to happen there. And that's as he wants it. OK, so you do not see the goalpost moving to this because I, I what I'm watching now is the process that we've seen of the radicalization of litmus tests that, uh, you know, again, and I've talked about this before, you know, up, up until five minutes ago, um, most uh, uh, pro-life conservatives had said, well, yes, we, you know, um, we're pro-life with with the exception, of course, you know, exceptions for rape, incest or the life of the of the mother. And now the, you know, that's not pure enough. Now you have to be for no exceptions whatsoever. In Louisiana, they're actually proposing a law that would classify all abortions as homicide, which could conceivably, if that passes, which I think is now, I don't know that it's likely because right to life organizations are actually against it, would result in mothers being charged with felony. So is it possible that this becomes a, a new litmus test? Because nobody... The thing we've seen on the Republican side is nobody ever wants to stand up against the, the 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 purest position. Do you follow where I'm going on this? Totally. And as I think you've pointed out, this whole culture in the Republican Party of you can't possibly be too conservative on abortion, right? That you want to go to the wall. You don't want to be the person who's insufficiently pro-life, right? You don't want to be the person who believes in exceptions. That whole culture has evolved in the completely warped row environment, right? An environment in which the Supreme Court makes sure that you can never actually ban abortion. So all of these conversations about the exceptions are theoretical, right? They're just a matter of gesturing to the pro-life community. Once Roe goes away, this all gets very real. And now the idea that you can ban abortion is totally real. And in fact, Charlie, we have these trigger laws, some of which don't have any exceptions for rape. So immediately the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party, is in the extreme position of saying no abortions will be allowed even for rape victims, which for a host of reasons is anathema to a lot of conservatives. So the other moving of the goalposts, I've, I've been talking about this issue for uh, decades, and I don't recall any significant uh, suggestion uh, that uh, Griswold, uh, the, the case that created a right for uh, individuals to have contraception, that that should be overturned. Contraception has never really been at the center of this debate. And now you are seeing some suggestions that maybe in some states they might want to ban contraception, I, whether that's serious or not, I, I, I don't know. But what is interesting about all of this is that if there is no right to privacy in the Constitution, if that's what the court is about to rule or suggest, it does impact these other cases because it was in the Griswold decision that the court first recognized an inherent right to privacy. Uh, so this brings up this whole issue of contraception. So let me just play a, a little soundbite from Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, who was on with Chuck Todd yesterday. He actually was on a couple of shows. And in both those shows, he refused to rule out a ban on contraception. So let's play that. You've just said that you believe life be begins at conception. If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, um, would you sign it? Well, I don't think that's going to happen in Mississippi. I'm sure they'll have those conversations in, in but other states. you're not states, answering but, the question. Uh, as is always the case with things. Well, that's always the case. There, there's, uh, there's so many things that we can talk about. 
Okay, so I don't know. It's, it, all the headlines are that he refused to rule it out. I, I basically saw him just trying to avoid talking about it. What, what was your take on that? Yeah, no, I don't think he's saying they're going to do it. But w- what you can see in Tate Reeves is an example of these Republican politicians. And Asa Hutchinson was the governor of Arkansas, was on another show also talking about this. These pro-life politicians are completely unprepared for the post-Roe environment. They're unprepared for a world in which they need to draw a line and say, look, we're only talking about abortion. We're not going to go to birth control next. We're not going to go to same-sex marriage next. We're not going to go to police in your bedroom, um, which has happened uh, next. So they they just don't understand. They're not prepared for that. And Tate Reeves, not the brightest guy in the world, you know, it seems like a very nice guy, but like just just absolutely bungled this in the sense of being on TV. And it's really important at this moment that Republicans say, look, we're just talking about abortion. Even Sam Alito, right, the Supreme Court justice who is trying to over who has wrote this draft opinion that would overturn Roe, is very careful to say, we're not going beyond abortion. This is just about abortion. But the Republican Party has not woken up yet that they need to be able to draw those lines in public. Well, a couple of points, you know, to underline what you just said here about how unprepared they are, because, I mean, you have decades and generations of Republican politicians who were able to say and do anything when it was theoretical. It was just checking a box. Uh, it, was, it was easy to answer a questionnaire or put out a press release because there were no real consequences. They knew it would never come to pass. So the entire framework of discussing this issue has now changed because now they're firing little ammunition. Now it has real world consequences. And there is that that difficulty in in figuring out how they're going to uh, handle handle all of that. So I, I do think that there is that there is that, that that complication that many of them face. But I'm also I also am, am struck by the fact that uh, many of the pro-choice advocates are also somewhat unprepared. Uh, to deal with this as well, for the reasons you mentioned, you know, as, you know, the the refusal to focus on the the kind of the sweet spot of of the early term abortions, but but also, you know, I I said before that the foundational question was who gets to choose. Uh, well, that's from the pro choice point of view. The pro life point of view, and I'm going to continue to use that phrase just so you know. <laughs> the pro life point of view is though the foundational question is is abortion the taking of a human life, if Abortion is the taking of a human life. Conceptually, you're going to think about this legislation in a completely different way. I'm watching a lot of the rhetoric about this, that, that no, this is all about you know, the patriarchy and controlling women or you know, you know, punishing women, et cetera, which ignores the fact that there are millions of Americans, many of whom used to vote for Democrats, who now vote for Republicans. And I'm not just talking about white rural voters or, or working class voters. I'm talking about African-American voters, Hispanic voters who genuinely, sincerely are offended by abortion, oppose abortion because they think it is the taking of innocent human life. And I, I, maybe we're in this post-persuasion era, but a lot of the rhetoric that I, that I hear uh, does not take that point of view into account at all. Your thoughts? Yes, yes. You, I, I agree with you, Charlie. And I think this is an opportunity, you and me having this conversation, because I think you come from a pro-life background and I come from a pro-choice background, even though we can understand arguments and we sympathize to some extent with arguments on the other side. And I, you are correct. First of all, let's just back up and talk about this issue. This, is, this issue is different from any other issue. Um, there is a faction of people in this country who believe that the fetus is a blob. They believe that what is inside the womb uh, prior to birth or prior to viability is at the beginning. It's a collection of cells. It's just, you know, let's not attribute anything moral to this, to this thing. They are wrong. They are just scientifically wrong. Okay. Uh, I am not part of this blob faction. Pregnancy, pregnancy is one person originating and developing inside another person. That just makes it different from every other issue. You have to deal honestly with both aspects of that situation. Anybody, any argument about the rights of one of those two parties that doesn't acknowledge the other party will not be adequate, will not be more, it will not be truthful, it will not be morally adequate, and I don't think it'll work politically. So it makes sense since this is a gradual process 
to treat the situation, to treat pregnancy differently, to treat abortion differently at different stages of the process. That's not just a political compromise. That is a logical, moral thing to do. And so from my point of view, I am pro-choice, but I believe it's very different to make this decision early and to make it late, right? At a certain point, if you haven't made the decision, you've made the decision. I also have not heard much discussion of sort of the internal contradictions in some of the positions. I mean, obviously, look, I'm, I'm willing to spend a lot of time talking about the internal contradictions of a pro-life movement that clearly is not pro-life in any other context. I, mean, I, I think those were legitimate points. And, and actually, you know, I, I know, maybe we should get to this at some other point. There's a lot of commentary about much of it tendentious. Um, about uh, never Trumpers who have gone squishy on abortion or changed their mind on abortion. I actually continue to be pro-life, but I do think there are legitimate concerns about the people we used to ally with, um, their judgment, uh, their character, and the way they have changed their positions also. As uh, time has gone on, uh, I have, I have, I think that in order to create a pro-life culture, you're going to need to change hearts and minds. You're going to need to be persuasive as opposed to be coercive. And at some point, I think Republicans are going to have to confront this, that if you create these blanket bans, you are going to have crisis pregnancies of young women, many of them lower income. How are you going to respond to that? Are you going to continue to oppose any sort of of social programs that are actually pro-child and pro-family. So all of that is is there that we, we have to do these things. But uh, you know, one of the things we haven't heard a lot about the contradictions is, well, what about fetal homicide laws? Do people who believe that there should be no restrictions on abortion whatsoever, do they think that we ought to remove uh, legal protections for unborn children who are you know killed uh, violently? I remember the debate about uh, fetal homicide bills, and I think that one of the key things was, look, um, clearly this is not a matter of choice. There's no issue of you know, right to choose. It comes down to, is that a human life that deserves legal protection or not? And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think the vast majority of states have fetal homicide laws. Have you dealt with that issue? Because, I mean, there, there's a real, I mean, that's where the law acknowledges the personhood of an unborn child. Right. And there have been federal laws, I think one with the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, and these arguments about situations that are not an abortion, but where fetal life is involved, are absolutely a gut check. At one end, there's the people who say the fetus is nothing, right? They say it's nothing because they want to preserve the right to abortion. But as you point yeah. out, when we get outside of that context, they acknowledge that's not true. The fetus is significant, significant enough to protect with legislation in a way that you wouldn't protect nothing, you're protecting a something. Conversely, I just wanna point out on the other end, there are people who say abortion is literally murder, but then they don't behave that way. Right. They don't behave that way, first of all, in the case of rape or incest, where they say, look, if this person was the result of rape or incest, we're gonna allow the abortion. That does not make sense morally. It might be a political compromise, morally does not make sense. Also, many of those, these people don't treat the then born, they don't treat the fetus. For example, if you actually treat it as a person, there should be health care for fetuses. There, it should be as serious as health care for born children. And a lot of conservatives who say they're pro-life, say this is a child, don't treat it like a child. Well, this is the problem of the absolutist logic. And I, I remember having a, a, a very awkward conversation with, with a very, very intelligent, learned person who... Um, was discussing the uh, the moral justifications for attacks on abortion clinics. And his point was, and actually he was a priest, uh, his, his point was, well, uh, you know, was it more, would it have been morally justified to bomb a concentration camp? Well, yes. Um, but, um, you know, the analogy is a little bit strained. He said, well, no, uh, you know, if you believe that, uh, you know, people are, are being murdered, human lives are being taken, then you have a moral justification to step in and, and stop the murderer. And, and this is the problem is you, you get these, these shackles of the, uh, of the absolutist uh, logic there, which um, unfortunately leads to extreme positions. And, and by the way, that's why I'm concerned about the way the goalposts are going to move, because, you know, if in fact it becomes a litmus test that you say, um, that abortion is murder, then you can't have any exceptions, right? I mean, that's the problem. You can't have any exceptions and you're not going to allow uh, six weeks or 15 weeks. You can't if, if in fact you believe it is murder. And ultimately at some point it is going to impact, uh, you know, contraception. Uh, and uh, at some point you are going to have to come back and, you know, hold uh, the mothers legally uh, accountable. And you remember back in 2016, 
Uh, I remember this so well. Chris Matthews asked uh, Donald Trump about, well, you know, now that you've uh, you're pretending to be pro-life, uh, should the mothers be held accountable? And and Trump, who had obviously given less than five minutes of thought to this question his entire life. <laughs> so, well, yes, we have to hold women accountable. And then, of course, the pro-life men said, absolutely not. No, that's terrible. And he backed off. But going forward, we don't know where this is going to go. I don't, I just don't know. I think it's, it's unpredictable. Okay. So I, I have another, one more question. I mean, two more. I know we're spending a lot of time on this, but I, but I want to talk about the protests and your reaction to the protests uh, at the homes of the Supreme court justices, number one. And also, and I saw you tweeted about this, the speculation that if Roe goes down, then um, the Supreme court precedents upholding gay marriage might be next. And I want to talk about that after this. Well, I have to admit, I spend way too much time online and on the internet, but when I'm using the internet, um, I always use ExpressVPN because using the internet without ExpressVPN is like having a first aid kit, but not keeping it stocked up. Most of the time you'll probably be okay, but what if you suddenly get into a horrible accident and there's nothing in your first aid kit to help stop the bleeding? So this is why you need to think about this seriously. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, cafes, hotels, airports, any hacker on that same network can gain access to your personal data, your passwords, your financial details, etc. It doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack somebody. Just some cheap hardware is needed. A smart 12-year-old could do it. And your data is valuable. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling personal information on the dark web. Look, this is not being paranoid. This is being aware. So why use ExpressVPN? Look, it's an encrypted tunnel. It creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. Hackers cannot steal your sensitive data. It'd take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. And it's easy to use. Look, you fire up the app and click one button to get protected, and it works on all of your devices, phones, laptops, tablets, and more, so you can stay secure on the go. So again, what I like is not having to worry about who might be hacking in, whether it's malicious, whether it's somebody who wants to embarrass you or somebody who wants to steal your information. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash bulwark. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash bulwark. And you can get an extra three months free expressvpn.com slash bulwark. Okay, I'm back with my colleague, Will Salatan. So let's talk about this speculation about whether or not if Roe versus Wade is overturned because it lacks uh, deep roots in American culture and history, that that also raises questions about the the uh, the solidity of the Supreme Court decision in Obergefell, which legalized gay marriage. What do you think? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. And I would distinguish here what's going to happen politically or politically within the Supreme Court right. versus what's what lines can be legally defended. So obviously in this draft opinion, Samuel Alito is trying to carve out abortion from the other issues. He's trying to say, look, we're not going to go to, on to same-sex marriage. We're not going to go on to sexual privacy. We're not going to go on to contraception. Um, and he tries to sort of explain why, but he doesn't really. I mean, like, for example, you know, Roe failed as, as a solution to our nation's problems because clearly it politically did not resolve the debate, right? Well, the other issues are still, there's, you know, there's still a debate about same-sex marriage in this country. Also, you know, what happens if public opinion reverses itself? That is not a principal distinction. That is a, a political distinction. And the idea that like, there's a state interest in unborn life. Well, in the same-sex marriage case, the, the conservative side asserted that there was a state interest in what they call traditional marriage. And as you're pointing out, Charlie, this Alito's language about sort of the deep traditions of America is an invitation to go backward on a whole bunch of things. Some people have said to me, look, in reality, there are five justices to overturn Roe v. Wade. There's only like two to overturn the same-sex marriage decision. But that, again, not a principled position. They only happen to have two votes right now, but there's not a reason given why we wouldn't go backwards. So I think if you're going to take the Supreme Court out of all of these unenumerated rights cases, I don't see a good reason why you would stop at abortion. Well, this is the problem that, you know, Alito 
himself, you know, says that I can distinguish between abortion and all these other issues. But the heart of his critique of Roe is that they made up a right, that it is an unenumerated right. There is no mention in the Constitution of abortion and that only those rights that are deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition um, should be upheld. But that is the exact language he used in his dissent uh, on the gay marriage case. He wrote, to prevent five unelected justices from imposing their personal vision of liberty upon the American people, the court has held that liberty under the due process clause should be understood to protect only those rights that are deeply rooted in the nation's history. It is beyond dispute that the right to same-sex marriage is not among those rights. So once you begin to you know, hammer away at the foundations uh, of these kinds of things, because a lot of things are not in the Constitution. There's no reference to abortion. There's also no reference to contraception. There's also no reference to sodomy. There's also no reference to the right to procreate. None of those things are in the Constitution. And they have developed over a series of cases whose logic and premises are now being rejected, at least in the Alito draft. And by the way, the Alito draft, I need to emphasize again, the more I think about it, it is a draft. And my prediction here is that there are going to be a lot of concurring opinions, that you are going to see not just one opinion. I'm guessing that Kavanaugh is going to write his own uh, uh, opinion. I'm guessing that Gorsuch is going to write his own opinion. I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Um, not everybody's going to sign on to Alito's piece because Alito, um, Alito's draft is very, very much Sam Alito. <laughs> and I'm just not sure the other justices want to, um, you know, not have their own say. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think that's entirely plausible. But I do think that the leak of this opinion per se, the fact that it's out there makes it extremely difficult for the other justices to revise their positions now without looking political. That, that may be true. I'm guessing they've already done it, that this draft is from February and, you know, nowadays is May. OK, so um, big debate over the weekend about these protests at the uh, the justices uh, homes. Um, as, as I mentioned in my newsletter, Bill Crystal was actually trending on Twitter yesterday because he he tweeted out at, at some point, hey, this is not a good idea to be doing all. He said, please don't protest people's homes. Please don't intrude on people attending their houses of worship. Organize politically be civil, civically. And he has got this massive blowback from people saying, no, we need to, you know, this is so outrageous. This is such an attack on privacy. We can't pr protect the privacy or respect the privacy of the justices. Uh, you know, I, and, and I, I mean, I certainly understand the emotions, but at some point, um, will progressives understand that uh, this does not persuade people, this alienates people, and this is now given the right its talking point? Because over the weekend, all you saw on conservative media was it's all about the mob, it's all about intimidation, and this enables them to flip the script. And, and this is very, very, this plays right into the playbook. Democrats are the party of thugs and violence and Antifa and, you know, Black Lives Matter. And look what they're doing now to the justices. So your take when you saw the pictures at the home. Uh, my take is, ugh. My take is, uh, I, God bless my progressive friends. Their hearts are often in the right place. Their tactics very seldom are. They, you know, that this is foolish. All right. Going to the homes of these justices, it is wrong and it is stupid. All right, it is wrong for a bunch of reasons. Like, uh, do respect the privacy of the justice. It's stupid because why, in God's name, would you be directing your energy to these just these judges, these justices who have basically already voted? They've been put there to do what they're going to do here. What they're going to do is send this issue to the legislatures. They're going to send this issue to your governor, to your state legislature to your congressperson perhaps and they've you are in charge now you have the power to make the abortion laws what you believe they should be but your energy has to be directed not to the court it needs to be directed to your governor you know it needs to be directed to so you should be channeling all of your anger if you are a pro choice person into mobilizing yourself and other people look it's about to be an off year election right the democratic party is in trouble in this election you should be out there getting people to the polls calling people people who don't care about 
you know, the Biden administration or a Democratic Congress for other reasons, but who don't want their right to choose to be taken away, you should be getting those people out to the polls. That is where all of your energy should be focused right now, not on alienating the public at large by, you know, looking like you're just invading people's homes. Yeah, well, and, and scratching your ideological itch is not a sound tactic. I mean, just simply because you, you are upset and you, you're venting uh, does not necessarily mean that that is a a smart thing to do. And by the way, this kind of reminded me of the debate we had over the protesters who followed Kirsten Sinema into the bathroom and, you know, yelled at her there. I I remember writing a piece at the time going, guys, you know that you're not persuading her. This is not working out for you. And I just remember all of the folks out there were defending, no, we are completely justified because we're angry at her. Therefore, we're going to do this. Well, how did that work out for you in a Senate in which she is the decisive vote? I mean, really, it's a 50-50 Senate. Following people into bathrooms may make you feel good, but it is not going to get you what you want. Yes. Well, first of all, following someone into a bathroom is like literally an invasion of privacy. Uh, it, the whole point here is about privacy. Don't follow people into bathrooms. Don't protest as people ho- people's homes. Your point is about privacy. It is best made in other ways. Yeah, no, really. Look, I mean, I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, cinema, like everybody else, like the justices, I mean, they're fair game in their ways of, of confronting them, I suppose. You know, you can write about her, you know, in her case, you can go on cable TV, criticize, you know, petitions, organize, as you point out, you know, try to get people elected, but stay out of the bathroom. And that's really not that hard. And just leave aside questions of taste and decency. You know, people need to ask themselves these questions. I mean, is their behavior likely to persuade anyone? And will the tactic win more public support or will it alienate people? I mean, okay, well, this seems uh, futile. Okay, so one last thing here. You highlighted something on Twitter that genuinely surprised me yesterday. Chris Murphy, Democratic senator from Connecticut. I would say that he's a liberal Democrat, but he's a centrist Democrat. He's a pragmatic Democrat. And he was on talking about the momentum toward forgiving student debt. And I was surprised to hear this coming from a prominent uh, Democratic member of the Senate. He is, uh, shall we say, skeptical about the wisdom of simply forgiving student debt. Let's listen to what he had to say. I also think that this focus on debt um, excuses the colleges for this dramatic increase in tuition. Um, I sometimes think that our party spends a little bit too much time talking about the debt and not enough time talking about the cost of the degree, um, because that's where the real problem is. We're going to be in a perpetual cycle of having to forgive debt if college continues to spiral upwards to $100,000 a year. So um, I think a limited debt forgiveness proposal is legal. I would support it, but I think it's a mistake to put all of our eggs in that basket. That was interesting. And obviously, I agree with him completely. I've written a book about this, you know, the the cost of higher education uh, skyrocketing at the time that the value uh, was becoming somewhat more uh, questionable. Uh, And simply forgiving the debt, you know, doesn't do anything about the underlying problem of the ridiculous cost of higher education. Right. So I, and I, was, I was surprised by that, Will. Yeah. And, and what surprised me more and heartened me was some of the reactions to tweeting that out and to his comment generally, which, you know, he, he followed up with his own tweet about this. And what I noticed was people from the left and the right were agreeing on Twitter. That is by itself remarkable and is encouraging because they're both right. Like this is an issue where the left is correct to have identified a failure of, I don't know whether to call it a failure of capitalism, but people owe debts, right? And they're they're saying, let's cancel those debts. Now that is a progressive position because these people are sort of imprisoned by debt that they have incurred. And they've incurred it voluntarily, although in some cases in a somewhat predatory way. The conservative insight is you have to pay attention to the economics of this, right? If you just forgive the debt, right? And you continue to subsidize this thing. Subsidies drive costs, right? We're subsidizing higher education. That's driving up the cost. And then these people, the, the students and the former students are saddled with the debt. Then we forgive the debt. And as Murphy's pointing out, it just goes on and on. So conservatives are happy to join in in opposing this crazy cycle, but they want reform. They want reform of the system. So we stop subsidizing the insanity. So I sense that there can be agreement here between right and left.
Well, Matt Bai, is that how you pronounce it? Matt, Matt Bai, uh, writing in the, in the Washington Post, I thought made a great point. And he, he sort of harkened back to the formula that Bill Clinton came up with was that you want policies that say to people that if you work hard and play by the rules that you will get rewarded. And he said, he wrote, look, if Biden wipes out college debt, why work hard and play by the rules? Let me just read what he wrote. He said, a lot of other families made the difficult decision not to accrue that debt. Parents chose to forego retirement savings or nicer houses in order to sock money away for college. Students chose uh, cheaper state schools over private colleges, or they decided to take a pass on college altogether. Millions of other graduates who did take out loans worked for years or decades to pay them off, making their own set of painful career and family sacrifices along the way. What are we telling those families if Democrats declare a one-time debt holiday in time for the fall elections? That all their hard choices amounted to a sucker's bet? Right. Wow. I think that folks should not underestimate the anger out there. I and and I don't I don't sense that and that's why I thought Murphy's comments that Murphy kind of kind of gets that. Yes, yes. And this isn't this is just a serious blind spot on the left. I have friends on the left who if you make the point that you just made Charlie and that Matt by made and that the, the lot, they say, "Look, you're you're spiteful, you're mean, that's immoral." Uh this is but this is normal human ethics, right? Some some people made sacrifices, they made prudent decisions, and other people should not be. Th- that is a moral principle, the, the consequences of your acts, and the people who were prudent, that should not be ignored by a policy that treats people, profligate people the same way. I want to add one other thing on this subject, which is Democrats have kind of become the college party, right? They're the, they're the college educated voters. And there's a lot of sort of people walking around with student debt who like, they think that the college party should serve them and bail them out of their debts. College is an industry. It is like other industries. And I think progressives should think about it more like that. Do, do you favor bailing out every industry that, you know, abuses people that it partakes of predatory pricing, predatory lending? Um, that is a, and, and that's one where conservatives, because they sort of become the anti-college party, are willing to take a more critical look at the industry. And I think progressives should go with them as far as scrutinizing the industry. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think people like David Shore have, have made the point that part of the problem the Democrats have is that their staffs, um, their activists, you know, tend to be disproportionately, you know, extremely well educated, and and, and therefore, you know, it is their demographic. So. You know, at a time when they really ought to be thinking about, boy, how do we, you know, why are we coming off this way to uh, working class voters and rural voters and, and, and others, other voters who may be struggling with all kinds of other debt, there is this kind of blind spot. I, I guess I would throw this out, and I'm not proposing this, okay, but I'm trying to think about the problems that American families have and, and, the, and the, the different struggles that, that they are facing economically. If you're going to be proposing forgiveness of debt, why student debt as opposed to, say, I don't know, medical debt incurred during the pandemic? Because that's not voluntary necessarily. And so you have this massive problem of people with huge medical debts, and yet they are going to have to subsidize student debt. I mean, if you're choosing right. a debt and to that, forgive, that, I mean, I'm not going to propose, hey, let's forgive credit card debt or let's forget auto loan debt or mortgage debt. I'm not talking about that, but medical debt, I, I could kind of see that. Yes. And I think that that point you are making, first of all, it's excellent. And secondly, it illustrates what has happened to the Democratic Party, right? This would not have happened, I don't think, in the Democratic Party of 50 years ago, right? The Democratic Party has lost a lot of working class support, and it's just be, be having become sort of the party of the college educated, it, and especially the college educated dominating the information economy, dominating Twitter, dominating social networks uh, online. And so you hear the voices of these people who are the college educated who want loans forgiven. And I'm not not saying that working class people don't have some loans like this, but as you point out, forgiveness of other kinds of debt would serve the people in the Democratic Party and in the working class who are underrepresented in social media and in the leadership of the Democratic Party. Well, we will end on radical agreement here. Um, will, uh, great talking with you, and we will do this again next Monday. Great. See you then, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again.
just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's oh, like, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Stone, that I had known for eight years. And I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame you that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.